Good morning, and again, happy Mother's Day to all of you who are mothers or to those who had mothers. So um, appreciate you all being here today. Um, today we're going to talk about a very famous woman in the Bible. It's not necessarily a Mother's Day sermon, um, but, um, but I do think it's um, really important for what we're looking at today at our church. And I want to remind you that in the Bible, there are, there are so many godly women that get overlooked because there are you know, so many more men, and it's understandable in that day that the men were more, were more visible. But um, one of the hallmarks of Christianity and Jesus was the way he treated women and the way he brought them into um, as his followers. Um, in fact, there is uh, some evidence that maybe some of the best support for Jesus' ministry came from women, uh, the financial support, actually. Uh, so we don't know that for sure. The Bible didn't make a big deal about all that. But this is, I think, one of the most famous women. And I, 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 I call this message, Lucy Ricardo meets Jesus. Now, most in this, I don't know about on, on, uh, on the video here, but for most of us in this room, uh, or my age or close to it. And so you may remember the old Lucy show. And, and uh, one of the most iconic scenes, and I, I wish we could have played it for you, but since we're broadcasting this, we really couldn't do that for copyright purposes. But is Lucy in the chocolate chocolate assembly? Does anybody remember that scene? Yeah, it's that iconic thing where it just gets out of control. This woman in this passage today reminds me of Lucy Ricardo in that scene. So I, I kind of use that image there to help you get to, um, to what we're going to talk about. But before we get to the scripture today, I want to let you know there's an old phrase that I think is very true. And it's, you've all heard it. It's not what you know, it's who you know. We've, we've all heard that. It's some of the, in fact, there was a study a while back that said the people who perceived to be the luckiest in the world are actually the people that had the most friends. So the things that seemed to be lucky were because you had friends and the right connections. And I want to give you an example about that. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago when I was here that I had spent time as a street magician. And uh, so I'm going to go back to that stories, to those stories for a little bit and back to New York City, where I almost got beat up by the, uh, by the, by the big guy that uh, could have pounded me to the dirt. Well, one day we had a day off and I decided to get away from my team. Uh, actually, they probably needed me to get away from them. Um, I can be a little overpowering sometimes. And so I sort of hiked across Manhattan, just, just walking and exploring. And I came to the UN building. And I thought, well, I'd like to go see the UN building. So I walked into the visitor center and it was a hustle and bustle of things. And I looked and and the, the tour of the, there was like tons of people taking the tour of the UN building and it was probably 10 or $15 to take the tour. And, and I was a missionary at the time and that was the mid eighties. And I just thought, I don't know, I you know, would really like to eat next week. So maybe I won't take the tour. So I just kind of looked around the visitor center and then I left. As I'm walking down the street, I passed a woman who stopped and said, hey, you're the magician, aren't you? Now, when somebody, you know, you're like, well, uh, okay, what do I say? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, were you at Columbus Circle the other day? And, and she said, yes, I'm with the church. I belong to the church that brought you here. Said, this is, a, you know, great. It was great to meet you. I really love what was going on. We talked. And then she said, hey, were you see, visiting the UN? I said, well, I looked around the visitor center. That was it. She goes, you haven't seen inside? I said, no. I said, well, come follow me. And we walked across the street. We walked through this gate that said delegates only or, or whatever the word is uh, that you have for that. She flashes a badge and says, he's with me. And I walked in through the ambassador's gate or whatever they call it there, found that she worked at the UN, had a fairly high position. And so she said, I've got a little bit of time before I have to get to work. Let me give you the tour. And she gave me a personal one-to-one -one tour of the UN. And as we're walking through and looking at all these things, and we stopped and she goes, this is a cylinder that was an ancient um, uh, uh, Persian cylinder. It's like the one of uh, uh, the, the cylinder of Darius that we, that we have. That is, and as we're walking back and forth, I could hear other people, the tour guides coming by and they're saying the same thing. So I know she's taken the tour enough. She's given me all the details that are on the tour. But then the amazing thing happened. We, we just, hold on a second, come here a second. And so she said, we walked into this little room. It's about, oh, 10 by 10, maybe. 
And uh, she looks at me and she goes, hmm, Fred's, Fred must be off duty right now. She says, stand right there. And she walked to the other side of the room and walked through, looked through a door. And she went, okay, it's cool, come on. And so I walked into this door, through this door and walked out onto the stage of the General Assembly of the UN. And of course, it wasn't in session at that point. And as I'm standing there at the podium of the General Assembly of the UN, the tours are going across the balcony. And another one, like, who is that guy down there? What is he doing, you know? And I'm getting to stand there and kind of look at things. And then, I don't know if I should say this was being recorded or not, she took me to the Security Council room. And I got to sit in the seat of the chairman of the Security Council, all right? So it was the Russian ambassador at that point. So if I, get, if I disappear next week, you'll know I got in trouble for 35 years ago, 40 years ago, sitting in his seat. But... Um, so it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's, 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 I, I, there wasn't anything in me that, it, that made me eligible to take that behind the scenes story of the UN. But I knew someone that could get me into that kind of thing. And so it was a pretty cool story. The fact that it's this, the, my cool stories are from 40 years ago tells you how dull my life must have been since then. All my stories since then are about my wife and my kids. So, um, um, and I, anyway, they don't want me telling those anymore. <laughs> anyway, we'll get back to this. So let's get back to this woman. And this story is going to talk to us about, it's not what, you know, it's who, you know, um, now again, it's interesting that we're talking about a woman here because for most people in that day, it wasn't considered a good thing to be a woman. In fact, there's a story that, uh, or a, a tradition that Jewish men, sometimes when they would get up in the morning, there's a feet hit the ground. Their prayer would be, Lord, I thank you today that I am not a Gentile or a slave or a woman. And so um, let's celebrate this woman today. It's so Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. And again, it's a little bit longer passage than I usually use, <clears throat> but I think we're going to see why. I know it's a little bit small print up there. So I'll read it for you there. Um, now, one of the Pharisees was accresting him, being Jesus, to eat with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of, vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and she wiped them with the hair of her head and began kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she's a sinner. And Jesus responded and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A moneylender who had two debtors, had two debtors, one owed, the one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he canceled the debts of both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I, I, I assume the, the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And he said, you have judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, has been forgiven, for she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Then those who were reclining at the table with him began saying to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the great example of so many women in the Bible. Women who have been used by you especially, Father, for this great example of a woman who loved you more than most of us have ever imagined. And Father, right now in this hour, guide our hearts and minds through your Holy Spirit as we examine the experience of this woman. May your Holy Spirit give us wisdom to understand 
and to apply this story to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, this story is a little bit different. This message is a little bit different from most of the preach because I'm going to kind of retell the story to you. And I'm going to use a little bit of what's in the scripture here, but I'm also going to use a little bit of what we know of tradition from archaeology of that time about customs and about households during that time. And so I will kind of let you know, but I want you to kind of, if you've got your Bible open there, you might want to keep it there because, you know, I'm not going to add to the scripture, but I'm going to tell you some things and I'll try to tell you when it's stuff that we know from outside the Bible here. All right. Um, so as we, as we look at this story, you've probably heard this before, and there's, there's a couple of stories about women anointing Jesus feet. Um, one story is about Mary Magdalene. We believe this is a different story here. This was probably not Mary. Now, we can't be sure. Sometimes the gospel writers told the stories in different ways for different purposes. Uh, just like when, you know, two people have the same experience and then they're sharing that story, they'll tell it from two different perspectives. And so we can't totally be sure, but we believe this is a different woman from Mary Magdalene. And out of this story, I think there's two things that Jesus wants us to learn out of this. The first thing is... Our relationship with Jesus does not depend on who we are, but on who he is and what he has done for us. That's the first thing we need to get straight. Now, we live on the San Francisco Peninsula. Well, you guys do. I live in Fresno, but I used to live in the city, so I was, I was cool at one point back in my yuppie days. But, um, well, you should have seen the apartment I lived in. It was about the size of this podium here. But anyway... Um, but, you know, it's a place where we're, we're blessed. We've got all sorts of resources and we've got, you know, everything that we need and salaries are generally high. And this is sort of the good life and, and, and real estate prices are so high because people want to move here. They'll pay prices like that to come here. And so in some ways, this is the good life. And it's easy for us to feel like and think we've accomplished things by being here, that we're doing, doing well. I used to live in Marin County for a while, and everybody there feels like I've arrived when I live in Marin County. But in the church, who we are doesn't mean much at all. It's who Jesus is. So let's kind of look at the story a little bit with what I call some inspired imagination. And let's kind of look at what probably happened here. Now, in this story, we know that Jesus is teaching probably either in Capernaum or Bethany. We can't tell which. The, the stories, John didn't always tell things in chronological order. So if you look at where he was before, where he was after, he's either in Bethany or in Capernaum. I prefer Bethany, and I'll tell you why in a little bit, but we don't know for sure. But this Pharisee invites him to come over for dinner. Now, we always learned that Pharisees was a bad word. Those are the bad guys in the Bible. But that wasn't always true. There were lots of Pharisees who actually followed Jesus. Nicodemus is a great example. And there were many Pharisees who actually believed in Jesus. Now, this Pharisee was probably what we'd sort of call a, a celebrity collector. He was the local sort of, you know, uh, celebrity himself there. And Jesus comes in and says, Jesus, you got to come over to my house and have dinner. So he'd come over and have houses. So he'd be the, uh, uh, that was the early version of like a podcaster trying to get somebody famous on their podcast. Okay. And so he's getting Jesus to come over to his house for this, for this dinner. Now in that day, um, dinners were not, they didn't run by the clock as much because they didn't have refrigeration. You couldn't prepare in advance. So you, so dinners had to be a little bit flexible and, um, you couldn't always know who was going to be there and everything. I mean, just the schedules were not, it's, it's not like you could send out invitations and people make it. So there had to be some flexibility going on there. But as the story spread out throughout the community that Jesus is going to be at Simon's house, that's the name of the Pharisee, this woman had heard of Jesus somehow. And now we don't know how. We don't know whether she had met Jesus before or not. I like to think this is Bethany because this might be the woman caught in adultery that John tells us about in the next passage. We don't know that for sure. Because again, we, it could be because John doesn't do things always chronologically there. But it was of some woman who, who, who somehow heard of Jesus or had some kind of encounter with him before. And she said, Jesus is here. I've got to go see him. Now, as you know, if somebody famous has a dinner party, you can't just go crash the dinner party. Despite what you might have seen in movies or you know, comedy movies around here, people crashing parties like that, you just can't go in. But back in that day, you could. Because a, a party like that was usually held in the courthouse of the home. And a nice home had a large courthouse with it. A court courtyard, not courthouse, courtyard. 
there. Pay attention to what I mean, not what I say or sometimes, okay? A nice courtyard there. And you know during that time that they, that they dined by lying down at the table, lying on their, on their left side, propped up on their left elbow, and they would eat with their right hand. And so the way it might look, it's like there'd be a table like this, and they'd be laid with their feet sort of splayed out on benches behind them in the center of the courtyard. Now, part of the Jewish custom of charity, because they couldn't refrigerate the food, leftover food was often given to poor people in the community or poorer people in the community. And one of the traditions that had started, now this is not in the Bible, but we know this from some other outside sources, was that poor people could actually come to the party early, but they would have to stand way in the back like this against the wall, like behind the feet of the people there, just sort of stand quietly waiting for the things to finish so that they could get the food. So what, it, what my guess is that this woman hearing about Jesus being there decided, I need to go see him. The only way I can get in is to be one of the poor people. And so she went into the courtyard and she moved over around so that she was standing right by the feet of Jesus like this. As other poor people might have been standing around waiting for the banquet to get the leftovers. And as she's standing there, she is so enraptured by her love for Jesus that she's moved to tears. And then she looks down and notices that his feet have not even been washed. That was a custom. When you had a, a, an honored guest at your house, you would wash the feet because dirt roads, they wore sandals. So that was just a part that got the dirtiest. And it was just a nice custom. And I think she began to feel such pain that Jesus' feet had not been washed. Mixed with such love for Jesus, and as she's standing there, listening to the words of Jesus, as he's sharing at the dinner party, she begins to cry. She begins to tear up. And she's standing there between the wall and Jesus' feet. And as she's looking at Jesus' feet and just admiring and being so happy for being there, her tears begin to fall on his feet. And that's where the Lucy Ricardo part comes in. And so what happens when you splash tears on dirty feet? You get muddy feet. And she's looking there going, oh my gosh, I just cried on Jesus. And the, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm making a mess. And the tears start flowing. And, the, and, the, and the, just the, the dirt, the, the mud keeps caking on there. And then as she cries, she begins to realize, wait a minute, I'm washing away some of the dust and the dirt. And she continues to let her tears fall as she does this. And, 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 and but the, 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 the dust and the dirt begins to wash away from his feet. And she's thinking, I'm, I am, I'm washing his feet. I don't have anything else, but I'm, I'm washing his feet here. And then she thinks, no, I've got to dry them. I don't, what do I, I don't have anything to dry them at all. And then she remembers and she reaches up and pulls the pen out of her hair and did something that was unthinkable for a woman of that day in public. She let her hair down and she let her hair down like a prostitute might have done. And she lets her hair down and uses her hair to wipe the mud off the feet of Jesus. She's humbled herself by showing up as a poor person, by letting her emotions show, by being willing to touch Jesus when she's not been invited, by doing the servant's job of wiping the feet and of letting her hair down in a dishonoring way, humbling herself to show her love for Jesus. And then as she's leaning forward with her hair to wipe his feet, she notices the pendant around her neck, that it dangles out like this. And in that, dang, in that pendant is her alabaster jar that contains some very expensive perfume. For many women of that day, and again, we don't know that this is exactly how it happened, but I feel pretty confident this is probably the way it happened. That little jar of perfume was probably her 401k of the day. That was probably her life savings. That was her retirement. That if she could take money and they couldn't, you know, she didn't have any place to hide money, to hold money, but she could change it into that expensive perfume, keep it with her at all times. So that if she needed money, she could have sold some of it. And she takes that, her retirement, her 401k, and she takes it and opens it. 
and an act of love for Jesus. Boy, that does sound like motherhood to me. That's how my mother was. That's how my wife is with our kids. would give anything for them. And so here's what I'm seeing out of this. I don't know whether this woman was poor. I don't know whether she was a prostitute. I don't know if she was just goofy like Lucy Ricardo. I have no idea. But she was willing to humble herself and make herself of no repute. All for the glory of serving Jesus and loving him. And Mother's Day is a great day to remember that. Because mothers are such a great example of service and of love. And I hope, and I know not everybody here had a mother like that. Um, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I know in a group this size, it's possible. But it still doesn't take away from what God has put into us. And women, God bless you for, for who God has created you to be. And I know we live in a time when we are trying to blur the, distance, the differences between genders. And I do believe that, that we all need to be in touch with our masculine and feminine sides and that kind of thing. But there is just something in the tenderness and the service and the love that so much more freely flows from women than from men. That, you know, and truly, there are, there are theories out there that say women are responsible for civilization, that men would have never become civilized. No, and I'm not trying to make a joke of that. That they say that is the reason is that, that women and to protect children were a whole reason for civilization. And God bless you all for that. But back to this woman, what she can teach us is none of us has the right to stand before Jesus with who we are. That our own works, sense of self-worth, our own sense of, of, um, of what's due us, of what society might owe us means nothing to Jesus. And the church should be the one place where we have equal ground, where we're all willing to serve and to love one another, and then to serve this community. And there are so many people in this community that are discovering all the time that what they thought was of worth is not worth anything at all. But we have the message that says, hey, what you had was good for this world, but we offer you something more eternal, something that lasts, something that has real meaning, something that changes the fabric of the universe. And so we need to go out from here as servants to serve the others the way we want to serve Jesus. That's the first thing. Jesus owes us nothing, but we owe him everything. The second thing I see out of the story is that our relationship with others depends not on who they are, but on what Jesus has to offer them. So the first point is our relationship with Jesus doesn't depend on us, but it depends on what Jesus has done for us. Our relationship for others depends not on who they are, but on what Jesus has done for them. You see, in this story, some of you are the woman. You just love Jesus with your whole heart, and you want to serve him and love him, and I appreciate you so much for that. But in, there's some of us in this room, at least one of us, who in this story is not the woman, I'm Simon in the story. That's me. You see, I sometimes have been guilty of seeing non-Christians as being less than me. I have sometimes gotten impatient with sinners. It wasn't always that way. But as I did more and more church work and got more, uncomf more comfortable with being in the church, I became to see this as being better than those people out there. And that's not true. We have a purpose that's better. We have a position that's better, but we're not better than the people out there. And that's what Simon was like. 
Simon, if you look back at the story with me, uh, so I want you to keep your Bibles open. See the story there is that, that the woman's washing Jesus' feet, and Simon says, he must not be a prophet. He would know this woman's a sinner, and he's letting her touch him like that in public. What is with this guy? And here's the funny thing. Simon, it says, Simon thought, he said this to himself. That's what it says in verse 39. It says, he said to himself, but in verse 40, it says, Jesus responded to him and said. Now, brother, brother, that didn't scare you. I don't know what should. The guy's thinking to himself, and Jesus goes, oh, Simon. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That Simon, Jesus responded to him without Simon saying anything. And then Jesus said, I've got something to say to you. All right, alarm should have been going off. But Simon's an idiot. All right, he goes, oh, say it, Jesus. You know, Jesus says to me, I got something to say to you. I'm like, oh, Lord, okay. All right, what is it? Oh, my goodness. But Simon was just ready for it. And so Jesus tells us two stories about the two debtors. And in modern, just in minimum wage stories, in minimum wage today, one owed about $5,000 and the other owed about $50,000 in, in modern $13 an hour, California, minimum wage. A denarius was, was about a day's wage. And so he had one owed 50 and the other owed 500. And so it's, it's, it's um, so he talks about giving both, which one would, would love more the one obviously who was forgiven more. And then if you look down in verse 44, I love this phrase. It says, Jesus, turning toward the woman, said to Simon. And I love that turn of phrase there, the way John puts that. Turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, and then he asked this question. Do you see this woman? We all know the answer was no. He did not see this woman the way Jesus saw this woman. Oh my gosh. That Simon saw it, saw this woman through his self-righteous, I'm better than you eyes. But Jesus saw her as his beloved daughter in need of forgiveness that he offered her because of her faith. That's what Jesus saw. When you look at the people that we run across in this neighborhood, at your work, in your neighborhood, wherever it might be, how do you see them? Do you see them as Jesus does? Or do you see them as just somebody who's got a different religious tradition than you do? Or is on the different side of the political aisle than you are? Or does things differently the way you think they ought to be done? Whereas Jesus sees them as his precious creation that he loves and wants to have a relationship with. And we need to learn to see others the way Jesus sees them. The most beautiful story of this actually is something, I'm a little embarrassed myself, but I ran across this story, and I'm going to show my age here in a little bit. I actually ran across this story in Reader's Digest. Okay, it actually, in 1988, Reader's Digest published this story, and I saved it. But it's actually condensed from Woman's Day magazine from 1965. All right, and I, I did not read Woman's Day magazine when I was seven years old, I promise. But, um, but this story, I love this story, and um, it's about a researcher, an anthropologist who went to go visit some islands in the South Pacific. And I'm going to butcher some of the names of these islands. If you know them, I apologize, anybody that's listening. But, but I'm going to give you sort of a summary. I'm going to do a condensation of the, of the of Reader's Digest's condensation here. The um, anthropologist is writing, he says, the people of Kinawata, the island, all spoke highly of this man, Johnny Lingo. Yet when they spoke of Johnny Lingo, they smiled. And the smiles were slightly mocking. And I said, what, what goes on? I wanted to know. Everybody here tells me that I need to get in touch with this guy, Johnny Lingo. And then they break up laughing. Somebody let me in on the joke. Well, Shinkin, the man I was talking to, shrugged and said, oh, people love to laugh. You see, Johnny's the brightest and strongest young man on the islands. And for his age, he's the richest. 
Well, I said, if he's, he's all that, then why are people laughing about him? Shinkin replied, there's only one thing. Five months ago, Johnny came to the fall festival from, uh, came to Kenawada, the island, now he's not from there, came to Kenawada for the fall festival and to, and to find a wife. And when he found the woman he wanted, he paid her father eight cows for her. Now, again, ladies, I apologize for this. I'm not saying that you should be bought for anything at all, all right? Just ignore that part of the story as we go on with this. So he said, I, I knew enough about the, about the history here and about this to say, good Lord, eight cows. She must have been a beauty that would take your breath away. Well, Shinkin conceded, uh, she's not ugly. Uh, that's a bad sign right there, okay? Somebody setting up a blind date, you know? Well, what's she look like? Eh, she's not ugly. You know, like, oh, yeah, sign me up, okay? Said, but, but, only, but the kindest thing you could say about Sarita, the name of this woman, was that she was plain. Her father, Sam Carew, was afraid that he'd be stuck with her for the rest of his life. She was skinny. She walked with her shoulders hunched and her head ducked. It was like she was scared of her own shadow. And that's why the visitors, villagers of this island of Kenawada grin when they talk about Johnny Lingo. They get a special satisfaction knowing that the sharpest young man, the brightest, the richest young man was bested by dull old Sam Carew, Sarita's father. You see, all the cousins were urging Sam to ask for three cows for Sarita and then hold and then until he was sure and, and then hold out for two until he was sure that Johnny would pay only one. And Johnny just walked right up to Sam and said, father of Sarita, I offer eight cows for your daughter. Well, the next afternoon, I decided to go visit Johnny at his island of Nurabandi. So as I arrived, I asked for directions to Johnny's house. And when I met the slim, serious young man, he welcomed me with grace into his home. And I was glad to see that from the people of his own island, he had respect that had no mockery in it. We sat in his house and he said to me, did you come here from Kenawada? Yes, I said. He smiled gently. My wife is from Kenawada. Yes, I know. I heard that the marriage settlement was eight cows. Johnny paused and said, everyone in Kenawada knows about the eight cows? I nodded yes. And his chest expanded with satisfaction. And he said, and in Nurabandi, everyone knows that it was eight cows. Always and forever, when they speak of marriage settlements, it will be remembered that Johnny Lingo paid eight cows for Sarita. And then I saw her. I watched her enter the room to place flowers on the table. She stood for a moment to smile at the young man beside me. Then she went swiftly out again. She was the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. The lift of her shoulders, the tilt of her chin, the sparkle in her eyes, all spelled a pride that nobody could deny. I turned back to Johnny Lingo and saw he was looking at me. Do you admire her? He murmured. I, I said, Sh -sh -sh she's glorious, but that cannot be Sarita from Kenawada. Johnny smiled, said, there is only one Sarita. Perhaps she does not look the way that they say she looked in Kenawada. Do you think eight cows was too much to pay for her? I said, no, I don't, but how could she be so different? Johnny said, do you ever think what it must mean to a woman to know that her husband has settled on the lowest price for which she could be bought? And then later when women talk and boast of what their husbands paid for them, one says four cows, another says maybe six. How does she feel, that woman? who was, had only one cow. This could not happen to my wife. I said, then you did this just to make your wife happy? I said, oh, I wanted her to be happy, yes. 
but I wanted more than that. You say she is different. This is true. Many things can change a woman. Things that happen inside or things that happen outside. But the thing that matters most is what she thinks of herself. On the island of Kenawada, Sarita believed that she was worth nothing. Now she knows that she is worth more than any other woman on the islands. I wanted to marry Sarita. I loved her and I loved no other. But he finished softly. I wanted an eight cow wife. Now, there could be lots of problems with that story. <laughs> the selling of women and dowries and things like that and the, the selfishness maybe of the men there, but let's try to look past some of that here at this point. And here's the, the, the one thing I want to get out of that story is that Johnny saw Sarita with different eyes. And once he was able to express that to her, it changed her. First for us, there may be some of you watching or some of you here right now that think you're not worth very much. Maybe the pandemic has been hard on you. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you've had a setback in your career. I, I know I have. It's been, it's, it's been a tough time career-wise for me for lots of reasons. Maybe relationships have been faltered. Maybe even with your mother who may live far away, my mom who might be watching, hi mom at some point, um, it, she's in Georgia and I've not seen her in a long time. There may be things that have you depressed or worried or fearful and you just may not feel like you're worth much. Part of what we're about here at Western Hills Church is helping you see yourself through the eyes of Jesus and know that he gave his life on the cross for you. That's how much you are worth. The life of the son of God, Jesus Christ. And second, we have a message, a mission to the community around us who live the lie that they are not worth much or live the even worse lie that they are worth a lot because of how much they own or how much they do or how many people they know or where they're able to go. And they are worth nothing because of those things. And they too need to see themselves through the eyes of Jesus. And guess what? We are those eyes of Jesus to go see them and share that message to them and let them know that, well, I wouldn't go up to them and say, hey, if you heard the good news, you're an eight cow wife, but you get this, you get this idea there that their lives can be changed and transformed in a way so much deeper than Sarita's was in a way like the woman in this story who washed Jesus' feet. Jesus ended the story with saying to her, let me get it back here again, because I've got a different translation in my notes here, so that's what I'm looking here. He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And he told her, your sins have been forgiven. That's what we're offered to you right now. If you're dealing with sin, if you're dealing with struggles, if you're dealing with sense of worthlessness right now, we want to help make help you see yourself differently because Jesus sees you differently. So we're going to sing a song of invitation here in just a moment of response. And I know for those here in this room, we're still trying to practice COVID stuff. I will have my mask on in a moment, but if you need to talk with me during that time or right after the service, I will be glad to talk with you about that. If you're watching online, I'm going to say too, you can reach us through our website at any point, and we will be glad to respond to you and let you know how your sins can be forgiven and your life can be transformed, just like this woman who humbled herself to serve Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much again for the opportunity to worship you today. Thank you again for the concept of families that you've built. And Father, what 
you have put into women to make motherhood such a special thing. And Father, may it not be just today, but may it be every day that we celebrate your love that is shown through mothers, shown through women, but mostly, Father, shown through your son, Jesus, as he died for us. And Father, help us to see this good news as something that needs to be shared with the whole world because you love them and died for them too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.